you know, this sensor here has seen better days. It, in fact, it looks quite terrible. So maybe we can just, what the, well, crap. Well, that's not good. All right, hey, so uh, welcome back to Yogi's Garage. I'm gonna pull the interior out of this car just to see how bad overall the rust is on the floorboards so then I can move forward with a final decision. So I'm gonna set you up inside the car and I'm gonna start taking off trim. The one thing about the carpet in this car is that it's a one piece and the foam and everything is integrated and unfortunately a lot of the foam on the passenger side was not recoverable. It, it was completely soaked, rust soaked and mold and mildew had also settled in. So that's going in the trash. I was planning on doing a different interior anyway if I keep the car, so it really wasn't that big of a deal. But let's get going here and uh, we'll start taking out this ugly carpet. Let's do it. Here's a brief little Yogi's tech tip. Always take notes. As you're working on a project, you're taking things apart, write down important things like where things belong, what kind of parts you took off, what's missing, action items, things like that. Of course, putting things in bags and label them also was very, very helpful. That gas pedal was a bit of a bear. It had been sitting there for 20 years and trying to lift it up and out was kind of a challenge, but you can see there that I used a pry bar as well as a panel remover. As I'm pulling this stinky, gross carpet out, I, the only thing I regret is not wearing a mask or a respirator of some type, because no telling what kind of particles are in that. Well, it doesn't take a whole lot of screws to get the center console out, you know? one or two and uh, you can get it out so I got a few more trim pieces to do I got to figure out how to get this shifter out you're supposed to turn it the collar that's some I got like 90 degree turn and pull but I also warn you not to pop yourself in the face when you do it and I've been there but everything else is is off you can see and probably never <laughs> Never going back in here either. All right, I'm uh, getting ready to move, remove the shifter assembly here. And what I wanted to show you is the ease of getting it out. So I've went ahead and removed the cable from the shifter itself. And then these collars here, there's a plastic wing right there. You just pinch those in and they pop straight up and then you can get the whole assembly out. So let me see if I can go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, easy peasy, like everything else. And shift knob removed. I don't believe I'll be putting this one back in. All right, um, I think I've reached a point where I'm gonna get the floorboard carpets out and then I'll, I'll cut them off. Cause the carpet, as I said earlier, is one piece, which is brilliant, but not when you're trying to get it out and it's all dirty. So I'm gonna cut the, the bottoms off and just get the gross stuff off and then I'll tackle the bench here because they're wet as well. I'm just gonna lay it down right here to kind of give you the lay of land here. <laughs> you can see what I'm looking at. Is the driver's side and you can see where the, car, the seat is supposed to go. Pedals, your feet. Everything is right there. And just to give you some perspective on what the carpet originally looked like, it looked like that. Beautiful, metallic gray. And now, 20, almost 20 years later, it looks like that. I did a really thorough job on just cutting everything out to make it easier for me rather than trying to tackle the whole thing. So I'm gonna come around the other side and I'm gonna pull that out as well. And that's when you can see the true level of destruction. Lots of money, I count all the money I find. Help pay for the rust repair. All right, and like I said, this is already cut. So I'm pulling out the remains of the passenger side 
and you can see the area that I cut out, which was just basically a bowl of liquid. That area right there, you can almost see the water line on how deep the water got in the cabin. I mean, seriously, they should do IQ tests on people before they let them buy cars, especially supercars. So you can see that the damage is isolated here. When I take it all out and I look at it, I don't feel as bad as I did yesterday when I was just slapped in the face with the amount of rust that was allowed to accumulate on the metal. Nevertheless, the, the damage is there and uh, I have to address it. But take a look at the uh, interior. Probably hasn't seen the light of day since uh, January of 2002. That was the assembly month of this car. So what's next? I'm gonna take all the wet stuff out of the back. And yeah, believe it or not, two months later, it's still a little damp. All right, rear seats are out, seat belt, buckle, mount points removed. Um, more rust discovered on that side. The buckle you see over there, the whole collar, the threading collar, just completely sheared off. So uh, anyway, all that's done. Now what I can do is go ahead and remove the back part of the carpet and then we'll be carpet free in here. Here's a little gratuitous B-roll footage of the center console area and all of the debris that collects even underneath the carpet. There's human skin and gross hair and all kinds of stuff that I'll eventually clean out with pleasure. What's your opening there? I'm hoping it is my uh, replacement steering wheel that I got for almost half the cost of an eBay sellers. They had a really good price, under 400 bucks for a black one with an airbag. So here we go. All right. Moment of truth. Oh, it's beautiful. Yes. Yes. I can I can condition that leather back to life. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. And it's bolted in. Awesome. Got a black steering wheel. Oh, yes. All right. So I've had to replace the turn signal stock as well as the clock spring here for a couple of reasons. But I want to show you the turn signal first. So the symptoms that I was experiencing in Pepper was the turn signal was not self-canceling. So, you know, of course, that means when you turn the wheel and you want to make a right turn and when you go back to center on your wheel, it should auto cancel. This was not doing it. Uh, the reason is, is because the, when the clock spring is in, it's sh this little lever here, you can see this lip right there, that tab actually kicks in this and causes it to trigger it. But this thing is damaged to begin with because if you compare it to one that's not damaged, which is this one, the one that I bought, I'm gonna put both in the left turn signal position. And you can see here the damaged one here. Look, see, it doesn't even do what it's supposed to. And look at this one, nice and springy, comes back to center, no problem. This one, it jams up on the right turn for some reason. Uh, so there's something mechanical wrong here, obviously. The other issue is my, t my wipers were not working. I'm not convinced that this is gonna be resolved with this. It would be a double bonus if I was able to resolve the turn signal and the uh, wiper issue, because I don't have wipers in the car. So moving on, this is the clock spring. And for those of you who don't know what a clock spring is, all steering wheels nowadays have controls on them, electronic controls to control the volume, change the gears, answer your phone, things like that. All of that typically goes into something like this. And the reason that it does that is because your steering wheel is not a fixed object. It, it, you turn it and you turn it the other way. And what will end up happening is if you didn't have something like this is your wires 
would get twisted all the time you're making turns, right? So this keeps constant contact with the signal inside of the clock spring. And in this older car, there was only a couple of things that are on the steering wheel. This right here was the airbag. And if you remember when I pulled it out, this is why the airbag was not working. This dude used electrical tape and, you know, just kind of did this. Jammed it in there and stuck some tape on it and expected it to work. That didn't work. The other wires you see here are for the horn, okay? When I pulled the one, it was so rotten and corroded, it just broke right off. And then this one is uh, cracked, as you can see. So, needed to be replaced. It was damaged. The tab there is completely sheared off. If you take a look at the replacement one, it also has what it looks like is a wire holder, and I'm pretty sure it's probably for holding the horn wire. But also, the big bonus is, look at that, that is a perfectly functional looking connector for the airbag, which is here. The airbag is pretty straightforward. It has one signal right there and it plugs right in, but it won't work and it won't save your life if you try to put something like that back in your car. So watch out for shoddy mechanics out there. This is the new clock spring. This is the new turn stock. It has everything I need, cruise control, the computer access, everything looks great. It's nice and clean. So super props to the guys selling this on eBay. I have to give them a nice positive feedback. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get rid of the broken parts and I'm gonna put them off to the side and figure out what I can sell. I'm pretty sure I can sell the cruise control module and I'm pretty sure I can sell these caps. These are pretty valuable too. Believe it or not, everything is valuable. And not, here, I'll give you an example, not to go off on a tangent, my ugly steering wheel, valuable. I promise you, at in this condition, I can probably get several hundred dollars for that. Uh, the chairs are in bad condition, the rails are trash, but any of the carpeting, things like that, that's all sellable. So I haven't decided what I'm gonna do on the leather chairs. I may just have them dyed. The leather is in good shape on the back seats. The front seats, I'm gonna get cleaning on these and see what they look like. I got to put a chair back into Pepper so that I can have Pepper inspected and I can drive this car legally on the streets. So luckily for me, the mounts here on the driver's side are none the worse for wear. I'm going to get my uh, wire wheel out and just brush those off. I'm going to invest in some in a rattle can of spray and eventually uh, once I get everything Recarpeted and things i'll have all that taken care of as well i'll have to put the gas pedal back on but other than that in order to get the car inspected i'll need to put a, a mirror on and of course get this top to work or at least take it down so i can have it uh, inspected i'm going to go ahead and put this steering wheel back together but not before i clean 19 years of crap off this plastic so let's do it. I am still working on getting this car inspected. Unfortunately, Safe Light, the company that I elected to go with, didn't check their stock before they booked my appointment. They were supposed to be here today. Uh, what ended up happening is that they did not have the uh, trim or the, the seal around the windshield. That's a custom Porsche piece, so they'll have to get that through Porsche. So I'm anticipating that it'll probably be a week delay for that. So in the meantime, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to resolve the uh, steering lock and ignition mechanism problem. So if you recall, I mentioned that the steering will not lock when you take the key out. That makes things really difficult when you're talking about changing the tire on a car, right? If you're stranded on the side of a road and you get your breaker bar out to break the bolts loose and the steering is not locked, it'll turn with you as you're putting pressure down. So it's a huge issue. I, I got a new part that I got at a discounted rate, sort of, it's still expensive, uh, brand new from an eBay seller, so fingers crossed that it is brand new. When I plug it in, we'll see it looks really good. So I'm gonna do that, but for right now, let's work on getting the control gauges out of the dashboard and getting the ignition switch behind the dash so that I can replace it with the new one. So there's a couple things I need to do. Obviously, like anything else, the first thing you need to do is disconnect the power. So let's go ahead and get started 
and I'll set you up. This step here is critical, guys. Make sure you cut the power and wait a few minutes. Okay, so I got you set up here to uh, remove the light switch. There's a, a couple of T20 screws here. I believe there's, yeah, just two pulls this straight out. But first, I got to remove the cap. By pulling this out, there is a, a, a little switch that you can use a, a mechanics pick or something to di disengage. And then uh, you can get to the ring on the outside, which is an illuminated ring that's screwed into the dashboard here with another T20 or T25. So let's go ahead and pop that light out, light switch. So first things first is we'll pull this out and there's a little divot in here that you act, that you push in and then it comes right out there. And there's the little switch right there. You just had to push that in to pop that out. I believe this is a 24 millimeter nut there. You got to take that out as well. But it's here and I have it on my lowest setting. Okay, I'm gonna take this screw out here. So it's a T20. There, pretty much out already. Get my little magnet. This whole thing's gonna come out connected to the vent there, as you can see. And here's the wiring for the illumination. And then here's the wiring loom for the light switch, which is this huge dial. And this just comes, do it a little, a quarter turn. And the whole dial comes out. This is separate now. So I can snake that out. Actually, I'm gonna leave it like that for now because I don't need to take it out. It's not damaged. And then this is just a pull. There, okay, done. Okay, so the next step is to disconnect the ignition switch here. Now, the instructions say that I need to disconnect the wire, which I already did. It's the same type of wire that you'll see here. Unfortunately, getting a camera up there and making uh, usable footage is gonna be very difficult. But basically after that, then I have to loosen up some set screws that are holding the ignition in. And then I come back up here and I remove the gauge cluster from up here to get access to the um, ignition switch. Now I may be able to do those sets, set screws from the top, but uh, the Pelican uh, parts author who does the uh, 101 things you can do with your car states to do it this way. The repair manual doesn't really go into too much detail as far as how to get access to it. So I'm gonna go underneath and hope I don't hurt myself. All right, so the next step is to remove the gauge cluster. It's pretty straightforward. There's a screw behind this microphone hole and then there's another screw behind the hazard button back there on the other side of the cluster. So I'm gonna go ahead and set it up and then get it disconnected. Right, let me take this move straight out, and there you go. Pretty simple process. So now that I've taken the microphone cover off, there's a T15 back there, and I'm going to use my trusty Milwaukee quarter inch and just pop that out. Okay. Like I said, I got to get that hazard light out and then get to the next torque screw. Right. Just pull, but I see a tab, so I'm going to pull it like that. There you go. Ah, oh, yes, these tabs. There. See, now that's out. There's a little tab right there. All right, so basically at this point, I have to remove the wiring harnesses back here. <laughs> as soon as I touch the connector, it falls apart. So even in areas where you don't see accumulates trash and grime and body excrement, whatever. So I'm gonna clean all this up before I put the module, the instrument cluster back in place. Okay, so next thing is I gotta remove this heater duct. Yeah, okay, so that gives me access to the uh, ignition. All right, I went ahead and switched over to my phone so I can get a better look at that pin. So 
that's where the bolt was there, you can see, and then there's a lock pin you have to push in to release the steering lock. To release the steering lock. I know, I'm talking on the other side of a windshield. So that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pop that out and see if we can get it. All right, I managed to get it out, a little bit of a pry bar movement for pull this whole thing out. Here's the harness that has wiring attachment on it, and then it should just come right out. All right, last but not least, the ignition or the, the key locking mechanism needs to come out. Uh, so let me flip this around. You see that little hole at the bottom of the chrome lock there. So I need to stick the key in, stick it into the on position, and then use a, a paper clip or something to push there and it should come right out. Okay, it's a little more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, okay, so I got the ignition cylinder out, the lock cylinder out. You have to put it in the ignition position, not the accessory. So you turn it two clicks, then you'll notice that your paper clip or your safety pin in my example here goes further in like significantly. Uh, once it goes further in, then this thing just pops out. All right. I initially just wanted to do a side by side comparison on the different colors and what have you between the used part that I pulled out of Pepper and the new used part that I got from my good friend Bruce, AKA Texas Squirrel. But something else happened at the same time when I took this out, I was like, this sounds weird. It sounds like a maraca. Listen, right? Now here's, here's a new one or newish. And then again, this one. So I tipped it over and a bunch of stuff came out of it. I'm assuming little blast the plastic bits came out. And that is why, <laughs> that's why, oh man, I scratched my table. And that's why I had to replace it. Wow, that's ridiculous. <laughs> At first I thought it was sand. I was like, that's it, it's evidence that this guy took it for a swim, but no, it's plastic. Or a salt shaker. <laughs> yeah. What is that? Plastic bits, maybe some teeth. I don't know. Okay, so I got it out. Here it is next to the new one. And you can see that there's a few components that I need to remove from the old unit. So don't go throwing this away until you're done taking the pieces off. So what's, what do I need to take off? This uh, brass colored bracket here attaches to the dashboard frame so that it secures it in place. The ignition itself is part of this component. So luckily I have a new one. I don't need to worry about the problems in this thing. But this here is the immobilizer or a part of the, the immobilizer system. I'll take that out. And then this little wiring harness uh, adapter goes right there, here. So I'll swap all this out and then get the ignition system back in. And hopefully, just hopefully, I'll get the steering lock to work. All right, I'm just gonna start with getting the mounting bracket off. Pretty uh, straightforward, low hanging fruit. All right, the bracket's off. And then, oh, that's weird. And that was just sitting there like that. So it was jammed in there. I'm not sure why, but we'll hang on to it. And then we'll take this little bracket off. This is how, and put it on right there. This is how it's gonna get reattached. You just turn it and remove it. And then same thing here, pull that out. And then let's transfer it. There we go. Starting to look like a steering lock again. There we go. All right, one more thing. We'll try my awl. Yep, there it goes. Yeah, it's just uh, an expansion pin. And then this will come right out. There we go. Yeah, I'm learning, man. Porsches, you gotta be a little bit more gentle. 
especially old ones like this. So this goes here. Let's see if I can just drive it in. <laughs> I drove it all the way in. All right again, but this time I go all the way in there. All right. And now we're gonna put the uh, lock back in there and make sure it all works. Okay, I have it um, still engaged. So I don't wanna disengage it until, uh, until I get it into this system here. And then, you know, lock it into place. There we go. And look, that actually works. Let's look at the other one. That is jammed in there. This is ready to go back in. Okay, I spared you my um, acrobatics trying to get in there and tighten everything down. I got it. So everything's locked in, bolted in, connected, wires. Uh, there's no power, obviously. So what I want to do is test the steering lock. And there it is. Steering lock works. You don't need to put the clutch in. Okay. All right, so before I start, like anything, safety first. We're dealing with airbags. We're dealing with the roll bar system. Uh, so you want to get the power out of the car. You know, we're going to disconnect the power, and then we're going to let it sit for a couple of minutes so it can discharge before I start messing with the airbag module. Because the last thing you want to have happen is the airbag pop it in your face. That'll make for a bad day. So let's, uh, let's take this apart. All right, the car battery is disconnected. We're good. So we're going to wait. I have two new modules for airbag and rollover protection, but I've got to pop this plastic panel off where the rollover protection is located, and that's been pretty challenging. So this is what I'm going to try to do. Let's take a look. All right, so this doesn't come, doesn't flip back. It, there's two rods or pins down here that this thing is hanging on to. And um, some advice that I got on the forums is to pry up on both sides here and here. And <clears throat> here we go, did it. One side came off, you can see, no problem. So let me just finish popping this guy up here. There we go. And that's awesome because this little plastic piece here is $38 from a third party and like over a hundred from Porsche directly. So here's the module. I have the roll bar control module and the reason why I had to replace this is because when I ran a diagnostics on Pepper, it didn't even detect that I had a roll bar, roll bar module in my car. So that's a key indicator, or actually it didn't detect that I had roll bars at all. So uh, I got the module here and I'm, um, I'm optimistic that this module is going to repair or resolve the issue with the roll bar. But the only way I'm going to know is by connecting this back in. I got to cut that other module out, but I'm going to try to just put it in there because there's a magnet or some kind of sensor in here that detects when the car rolls over and will deploy those. So I don't want this thing to deploy on me when I'm trying to connect this. The battery's disconnected, plug in the control module, and we'll test it out. Let's do it. Push it in and then flip that white lever all the way till it clicks. All right, good. Now we're going to set it right here right next to this other sensor. So I'm gonna see if I can zip tie it like that for now, because what I wanna do is I wanna validate that this even works before I spend too much time trying to take that off. I've got the roll bar control module zip tied to the old one. I don't wanna bump it because I know there's sensors in there that, that determine whether or not uh, the roll bar should pop up or not if the car is turned over. Did it go away? No, it didn't. 
Okay, taking a look at the fault codes on the rollover protection. It may not even detect it, and that could be a problem. If it doesn't detect it, yeah, see, it's a problem if the car is not equipped with the control module. Damn it. So the control module is connected, but it's not getting power. So that's a problem. All right, I'm still investigating the problems with the roll bar, and I think I may have found something. I traced the wire. The orange wire you see there provides power. It goes in loops down this wiring harness and I traced it using a tone generator and it goes all the way over there and I am getting 12 volts on the fuse. What I'm not getting though is 12 volts to the rollover module. So if you look at that right there, you can see the corrosion on some of these pins. So I am getting voltage, but I wasn't getting 12. I was getting like... Um, 1.2 volts if you look at that this is probably the reason again it goes back to the water level in here this harness being the lowest one here on this wiring rack if you will probably got some water in it so i think i have a new product here that i'm going to try deoxid d5 this is meant for electronic connectors and it deoxidizes the the pins so I'm gonna give this a try and see if this helps and gets me 12 volts of this module. You spray that, give it a few minutes, try it again. You blow it out again and then connect it. Okay, I'm gonna run a voltage test on the connector coming from the fuse box and see that I've got 12.3 volts coming through this connector at this point, that's awesome. Now it's all based on what happens between here and here all the way to the control module. So now I'm gonna reconnect it and uh, test the voltage at the module. I'm connected to the wire that goes to the module. I tapped into the line. So now the wire has a very short distance. So I don't think there's gonna be a problem with getting 12 volts at this point. So now I'm gonna put the key in the ignition. And what's interesting is as I'm fixing more and more electronics in this car, more and more things are starting to work. I mean, go figure, right? You hear that? I mean, a beep. Never got a beep before, and there it is. 12.3, baby. Got it. It was corroded connectors. So I bought a rollover module that I can probably sell on the internet. So I'm gonna put the old module back in and see what happens, man. Yes! Okay, going into the rollover protection. And the first thing that we saw before was that it was not able to identify the module. And there it is, it's there. So, should have zero fault codes. All right, moving on. There it goes, yeah. it went out. Oh <laughs> yeah, that's a victory, baby. Okay, we're putting in the uh, control module now. My lovely assistant is putting the, the nuts back on the mount for the airbag control module. The, here, use this. To tighten. Mm -hmm. All right, we're just gonna reattach this thing in here. Okay, here's Charlotte. Use Charlotte on that. I am Charlotte and I'm You're gonna need to use two hands, one to hold it down and one to turn it until you get used to it. There you go. Is it tight? Yep. See if it's able to communicate with the airbag module. That's good. Check the fault codes. Great news. So the large triple digit error code is gone. All right, and like everything else that uh, you do, it's better to have um, a workshop manual or uh, some kind of reference guide so that you're not hunting around for a fuse. I don't have the fuse panel diagram even in the car because as you know, I've gutted it already. So this is certainly very, very helpful. So now I know what I'm dealing with. I'm just grounding my probe here. I have a, a fuse tester 
I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but each one of these fuses has a, uh, a metal contact there, which will illuminate in case, see right there, I don't know if that's gonna show up, but if there's power going to it, then it'll light up. All right, so it's a C6, so the third row down six. All right, A, B, C, wait. There's a fuse missing. Could it be that easy? Let me confirm that again. C6, 25 amp fuse. Damn, I hit my head again. A, B, C. Missing. All right, it's asking for a 25 amp, so a 30 amp should be fine, and I'm gonna go ahead and put it in there. And you hear a clicking sound already, all right. Okay, let's check power. Yep. Yep, we've got power to that. There it is. Beautiful. Look, in my defense, um, Maybe I have an older diagram, but um, that's a pretty low hanging fruit. I'm very lucky that it was just a fuse and uh, nothing more than that. That's the intermittent wiper going off. So uh, great news, uh, check that off the box. This car, after I get the windshield installed, will be ready for inspection and it will pass even though it doesn't have a passenger seat, but that's not required in, why am I looking at the light? But that's not required in, um, It's very distracting. That's not required in the state of Texas. All you need is a seatbelt. Uh, I got to clear the airbag warnings and it should be ready. So let me get everything buttoned back up and then we'll, um, we'll continue with the troubleshooting. I want to replace the brake wear sensors on this car. So I want to, uh, luckily my buddy, Texas Squirrel, AKA Bruce from Renlist was nice enough to give me a set of four. Um, and he's given me quite a few things. So. Awesome friend, thank you, Bruce. He also gave me a light switch replacement as well as a gas cap. So uh, yeah, he's, he's my new best friend. So anyway, let's take a look at the car where the brake wear sensors are and maybe we can pinpoint what the issue is and we can just replace the sensors real quick. It's, some, it's, a, it's a low hanging fruit, so let's do that. It looks like the brake wear sensor, which is over here, and it plugs in or clips to the brake pad here and then runs to the back. So you got a back brake pad sensor and a front brake pad sensor and then the main cable to the ECU connects to this thing, it looks like, and a speed sensor, it looks like as well. So, you know, this sensor here has seen better days it, in fact, it looks quite terrible. So maybe we can just, what the? Well, crap. Well, that's not good. That thing looks really brittle. Let's go take a look at the other ones. This one just looks like it's covered in dirt. Ah, I spoke too soon. Look at that. Holy moly, look. Well, no wonder the ABS or the, excuse me, the brake wear sensor is going off, man. Okay, well, the light's pretty bright. Um, I'm going to see if I can go four for four on this. How much you want to bet all four of them are like that? I shouldn't be surprised. Let's go take a look. So I wish I could have captured this on camera, but look at this disaster of a connector. 20 years of uh, Florida heat, and that'll do it, I guess, to a cable. And this rear sensor you can see here just broke apart in my hands. I don't think there's a rear speed sensor on the car, the only front speed sensor, so maybe that's an ABS. Uh, nevertheless, there's a 
part number right there. Okay, so that's number three. That's where the Black Widow was. Let's go see what number four looks like. Oh. Let's take a look. Yeah, that thing just, God, just crumbled. Oh. Yeah, bad, bad, bad. Yeah, I'm going to have to take those apart and get part numbers and order some new harnesses. Ten bucks, it ain't going to be cheap. Yeah, well, so it's evident that uh, I'm going to have to replace all four of those wiring harnesses on each of the four corners of the car. Um, you know, luckily, thanks, Bruce, I have uh, brake wear sensors already. That's one less expense. The wiring harnesses... I priced them. I'm trying to determine which one I need because um, they're one's about $100 and the other one's about $89. And one of them is a repair kit, which I think is what I need. And so I need four of those. Plus, I'm going to need new speed sensors and the ABS sensor, I guess, because again, there's a cable that appears to be a speed sensor on the rear. So I, that's my guess there. I'm going to have to, again, I'm going to pull it and pull the part off of that to confirm that it is indeed a, uh, a, a sensor. But nevertheless, I've got a lot of <laughs> repairing to do. My list keeps getting longer and my bank account keeps getting thinner. So let's, um, let's keep at it, man. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for my video this week. I think I've inundated you enough with what I'm working with on this car. But I wanted to give you an update overall on where we are with Project Pepper. Clearly, I've accepted the fact that the rust in the car is not as bad as I initially thought. After I removed all of the interior and I looked over the overall impact of rust, I realized that it was isolated only to the seat itself. Granted, I say only, but that area of the floorboard is going to need to be cut out. So I'm going to take care of that in a future episode. But as far as this episode's concerned, you can see I'm tackling a whole bunch of wiring issues. I've addressed quite a few. I addressed the airbag module. I have addressed the rollover. Some of the things that I left out of the rollover video was that I actually disconnected the rollover loops or hoops themselves, uh, but ended up not needing to do that because they're a very, very simple mechanism. But I, I, so I took that out. But nevertheless, the, the biggest shocker were the wiring harnesses on each one of these four corners. So instead of showing you a video the next time, I'm just gonna spare you that and just tell you what ended up happening. So as I ended that video, I told you that I wasn't really sure which harness I needed. Well, guess what? I went with the cheaper one and I got burned. I ended up installing the cheaper harness on all four corners only to realize that it was the wrong wiring harness. The ABS sensor, which is not a speed sensor, it's an ABS sensor, has a male and a female connector on it. The ones that I put in there were all black instead of the gray, and the all black ones have all female connections. So I had to pull it all out, and that was about $250 worth of uh, harnesses that I ended up wasting. I'm going to try to recoup some of the money on eBay, but I'm, I don't anticipate getting much. But nevertheless, the new wiring harnesses are in place, and that's for a future episode. So if you're new to my channel, I hope you really enjoyed this video, because I plan on continuing Project Pepper and hope that I can get this car back on the road soon enough. As you can see, maybe from this video, Pepper has a new windshield. So I have that going for me. Now I can get this car inspected just as soon as I get the wheels back on. So if you like what you saw, Consider hitting the subscribe button and hitting that thumbs up. If you didn't like it, hit the thumbs down, but hey, leave a comment below and tell me why. Because I'm looking to continue this project, but I need your support. I'm sitting as of August 31st, I'm sitting at about 382 subscribers. So thank you so much for your continued support, but I would love to hit 500 before my one year anniversary, which is near the end of September. So with that said, We'll see you next time on Yogi's Garage.